Thank you very much, and thank you as well, Richard, and everyone else who's organized this event. I think it's absolutely smashing that there's so many people here, so many people that have come to the cold, windy city of Edinburgh here in March and February for four languages. I think it's a very important um, thing here. So I think what I'd like to talk about today is a bit about the history of languages in Scotland. Now, initially, and if you looked on the website, it actually said a history of language in early medieval Britain. And then I thought, ooh, what have I done? <laughs> so... <laughs> In light of that, I decided to sort of to, to narrow the scope a little bit because I thought this is a huge topic. And actually, the topic of language in medieval Scotland as well is also huge. So I'm going to try and get through everything today, which is probably why I need to cut the, the preamble waffle that I'm going into now um, and get started. And I'd like to get started with this man. Now, this is my dad. He's the one on the right there. And... <laughs> And this is a little piece of revenge because he is a lecturer at the University of Northumbria and uh, since I was a very, very small boy about that high, me and my brother have always featured in his lectures and I thought, you know what, I'm giving a talk, it's payback time. So I have this image of my dad here. But th there is a relevance to this as well because one of my fondest memories of being a child is of going to Scotland um, on holiday. And always when we went to Scotland on holiday, we'd go over the Carterbar Pass. Probably many of you, if you drove up from England today, went there as well. And you're greeted by this sign saying, welcome to Scotland, um, with the Gaelic translation underneath. And my dad would always say, hmm, it doesn't really make sense, though, because the people in this region probably never spoke Gaelic. Or if they did, they didn't speak it for very long. And that kind of got my mind going, because to me, Scotland had always been a Celtic country. That's always what I thought of. I thought of tons, I thought of bagpipes, I thought of Gaelic and all of these things. Um, but this kind of changed me. Now, this as well, we always listen to the Corries. I'm not sure people of a particular generation from Scotland might know the Corries. Um, it's traditional uh, Scottish music. A lot of the songs are about the Jacobite risings in the 18th century. Um, if you go just down the road, there's a cafe with Bonnie Prince Charlie and full tartan that you can pose with if you like. Um, but these songs as well, I always thought this is a very Scotland Celtic country, but in a lot of these songs, there were these words that I could understand and now this shouldn't be the case because I thought, you know, Gaelic, I can understand nothing from Gaelic. But all of these words like fecht or kirk, flas, drich, I could understand these words from Dutch um, because I speak Dutch at home. And as well, these other words like gang, ben, klarty, spear, these are words that I have as well in the Northumbrian dialect. And I thought, well, why is this the case if this is such a Celtic place? Um, but anyway, to cut short the, uh, the waffle once again, just a little bit about who I am. Um, that's me. I, I do do reenactment as well. That's why I'm in chain mail. Um, so I run the History with Hilbert YouTube channel. I talk about history. I talk about languages and other kinds of things there. You can look it up if you like and have nothing better to do. We'll have trouble falling asleep. Either one of those, they're all fine. I'm also an undergraduate studying Anglo-Saxon, Norse, and Celtic at the University of Cambridge. So that's my background here. Um, and while I'm at it, I do have to thank some of my lecturers who helped me put this talk together. Um, Dr. Ali Bonner for Britonic history and Gaelic history. Um, there's a fellow Arsenac sitting in the audience audience there, so he probably knows some of the names, um, as well as Dr. Roy Naismith and um, Elizabeth Ashman Rowe there too. Um, I also speak Dutch at home, if you guessed the name, it's not a really weird name, I mean it is, but it's a, a Dutch name, um, and I study Old English at the university, and I have a background in Frisian as well. Uh, recently looked into some other languages, I did Spanish for several years, and Polish, thanks to my girlfriend, well I say thanks, uh, it's a lot of cases. Um, <laughs> But uh, yeah, I'm also a lifelong history and languages nerd. Um, in the words of my subscribers, though, I'm a talking helmet with sunglasses that does history stuff, um, a crypto Dutchman in an armored windmill somewhere, <laughs> and I saved the best till last, and Scott speakers, please correct my terrible pronunciation, a wee scunner of a sassenach seenach he bletherin on about the past. <laughs> so there you go. <laughs> but anyway, why this topic? Well, I think this is a really key topic for a lot of the issues that people have been talking about, especially in terms of the debate about Scots, whether it is a language, a lot of people are saying that it is, a lot of people are saying that it isn't, whether it's a dialect, and how do we go back to that? And actually the route to this is in the early Middle Ages, and I think it's important that we go back and look at this for talking about Scots in this context. As well, as I already mentioned, um, efforts to re certain areas of Scotland and whether there's a historical basis to this or not. Um, and furthermore, I think it's a really interesting part of the Scottish history and, and fabric. And, and certainly I remember 
um, when I learned about a lot of these different languages, I thought, wow, you know, that there's so much diversity, there's so much history here, but people really don't know about it, especially abroad. I'm not sure if people in Scotland do, they, they might, um, but I just thought it's an amazing topic. So um, to dive right in, the earliest language in Scotland um, we don't know. <laughs> so it's, it's going to be in, in a pre-Indo-European language there. Um, and actually, some of the names of the isles in the, in the Hebrides, uh, like Mull or Rum or Isla, these might actually be pre-Indo-European names, but it's really hard to tell. What I can tell you more about, however, is the Celtic languages. Now, when, when Celtic comes into the, um, the islands, we get a distinction between the two. And actually, um, Simon, you spoke about this yesterday, about the difference between P and Q Celtic, um, being that the Q Celtic languages retain the initial Q sound, whereas the P Celtic languages, this, this develops into a P, um, the Q in, in the Q Celtic going to a, a, a palatalized K sound later on. Um, and that's why we have, and again, apologies for butchering your beautiful Celtic languages and my horrible Frisian tongue, but K here um, in uh, Scots Gaelic and Pedwa, so you can see the K versus the P. Um, and this is interesting, but actually the first people that we do know about um, in the, sorry, in the, uh, <laughs> <laughs> from extant evidence it are the Romans. And the Romans come in, obviously they build the beautiful Hadrian's Wall across Northumberland, so actually Scotland sort of gets a bit of Northumbria too in there. Um, but we have Roman soldiers coming up here, we have inscriptions of different Romans uh, and diff different regiments coming in, for example. Um, and they're the first, and Latin will always be a very important language for Scotland. It's often a higher class language, but it's never really a language that the people on the ground are speaking to one another, um, which is why I'll, I'll kind of breeze over it quickly. Now, the Romans are also important because they give us one of the earliest place names we have for Scotland, which is Epidi. Um, and again, the P there is interesting because this is on the west coast of Scotland, and we have a, a P there, so it's probably a P Celtic name, which might be important um, later on. So now let's get on to the Picts. Very stereotypical depiction of them there, um, but you know I couldn't resist the, the little the little animated uh, boys that I make for my uh, for my videos um, on YouTube. But we normally see the Picts at least in an early medieval context, so sort of the early Middle Ages. That's the period from after the organization of the Romans um, and, and between that and the the kind of the uh, knights and castles and, and maidens. We have this kind of dark period that people call the Dark Ages. Um, we sort of find the Picts north of the Firth of Forth. They sort of skirt the Drum Alban, um, and they're in the Isles as well, the Northern Isles, the Western Isles. These are the Pictish-speaking regions um, for a long time. Now, they have absolutely beautiful um, sculpture. This is what they're famous for. These are both from Abilemno, for example, and actually this one, if you um, scoot down the road to the National Museum, you can see a really nice recreation of this yesterday. Um, yesterday. I saw it yesterday. You can, you can see it today. Um, <laughs> Let's not get ahead of myself there. <laughs> but <laughs> exactly, that's the one. But um, unfortunately, there's there's no language on these. So absolutely beautiful, um, but there's no written language, which is a real shame because the debate about the Picts has been fiery and furious for many years. Um, what we might get, actually, however, are some place names that could come from Pictish, these often uh, starting in Pit, so Pit Lochri, uh, Pit Sligo, Pit Slesi, um, that has been suggested. And we do get evidence uh, for the Pictish language uh, from Bede, who uh, was a Northumbrian monk writing around 730. And he says, at the present time, there are in Britain in harmony with the five books of the divine law, five languages and four nations, English, British, Irish, and Picts. Each of these have their own language, but are, all are united in the study of God's truth. And he goes on to say it's Latin, and it's great because it's Bede, he's a monk, he likes Latin, he likes that kind of thing. Um, so we do have evidence here of the Pictish language, but it's always good to be cautious with this kind of thing because he's saying, oh, we have five books just like in the Bible. And it's sort of when they're trying to draw comparisons between the, the world here and the biblical world, we think, mm, is that the case? Is it just a nice, uh, you know, convenient? And we also know from Beat, he doesn't like the Britons very much. So he might be trying to sort of separate the Picts and the Britons um, because we do try to locate uh, the, the Pictish language was often seen as being a sister language to Brythonic, that it was really different. But actually recent... Um, research done by um, Goto Rees um, 
indicates that it's probably a daughter language. So, so um, it's a similar relation uh, with Cumbric, which we'll get onto later, um, Welsh and Cornish. Um, I do actually have, um, which my girlfriend mocked me for relentlessly, a, a handout um, with several of of the uh, the things that I'm that I'm talking about, several of the sources. So, if anyone wants a handout, you know, see me at the end. Um, I've got a lovely pink folder there that I can uh, that I can open up for you, or I, I can email you one as well if you'd like. Um, so we sort of we see the, the distinction between P and Q Celtic. Um, the traditional view is that the, the distinction there is um, that we get Q Celtic in Ireland and P Celtic in Britain, um, and that the reason that we then get Q Celtic, because of course uh, Scots Gaelic is a Q Celtic language in Scotland, is due to migration that occurs in the fifth century and the sixth century uh, from Ireland as well, after the fall of the Roman Empire. Um, but is this the case? <laughs> Spoilers. <laughs> Um, so to move forward, um, I'm now going to take a look at the Gaels, who um, are often associated with Ireland. And the region that we associate them with is the area of Argyll um, on the, the western coast here. Now, they do, of course, later move on into other areas, but for a long period in the early Middle Ages, they are on this area in Argyll um, there. Uh, now let me think what oh, yes and most of the time people do think that the scholars have indicated traditionally that this is due to a migration we also get uh, sources uh, that suggest this but these sources are all from a later period that say that the sons of Urk uh, they come over and, and they form the different uh, kin groups of uh, the, this kingdom called Dal Rieda, which spreads over both now we locate the language that they spoke Godelic um, it's often called Old Irish at this time I've, I've called it Gaelic to, to keep things sort of simple, but a lot of these terms have old or middle, and are, are we sort of sweeping through a lot? And so they're related to the other languages. So as I spoke about Pictish earlier, being P, Celtic, Brythonic, um, and you've got Cumbric and Welsh and Cornish today as well. Um, so they're, they're related languages, but they're in a separate group. There's Q Celtic group um, that's there. But recently it's been called into question whether there was this migration by Ewan Campbell. Um, also on the handout, there's uh, were the Scots Irish is, is the famous... Uh, paper that he published and basically he said that actually the evidence on the ground for such a migration in this period isn't really there um, because often when we have a migration for example like the Anglo-Saxons we see the material culture in the ground changes the jewelry changes but we don't really see that in in uh, the area of Argyle um, furthermore you get the forts that they're building in Ireland um, they don't really bring them over to Scotland. You don't ever find evidence for sort of the wrath and the cashel, which you'd expect if there's new people coming and conquering a new area. Um, as well, the Cranog, which you find in Scotland and Ireland, actually we find earlier in Scotland than in Ireland. So it's, if anything, it's going the other way, not the way that's traditionally been seen. Um, um, I'm getting ahead of myself again. Um, and again, as I said, all these written sources for Dal Rieda, uh, they are actually from quite a bit later than the period um, that, that this occurred. Now, this sort of doesn't really fit well with us because we see this distinction. We see Ireland, it's an island. Britain, it's an island. So it makes sense that one language is in one area and one is in the other because we like to sort of organize things. But actually, on the ground, things are more complex. And actually, they could have developed uh, fairly simultaneously because this is actually looking out across uh, Scotland and Ireland with the islands in between. And actually, this the Dalrydans were a seafaring people, so it would actually be easier for them to communicate that way to Ireland than, for example, this is the Drum Album. These are the mountains that separate them from the rest of Scotland. So if you look at it that way, actually, the connection to Ireland is stronger than the connection to the rest of Scotland. And so that does make sense. Um, as well, administratively, Dal Rieda was split between areas in Northern Ireland and areas in Scotland, uh, historically speaking. Now, let me see where I was up to. I should also mention um, that Ewan Campbell's theory is, is nice, but I actually prefer a sort of middle ground theory, um, which is Catherine Forsyth's th uh, theory, which is that there is earlier contact between Ireland and Scotland, but that the whole Sons of Irk and these sources that, that describe it in the 5th century is actually a shift in dynasty, that a new dynasty comes over from Ireland. And that's why we don't find a change in material culture, but we do find a change in the name of the political groups that we see there. So to move from one can of worms to the next, um, and I'm moving too quickly, so I see, um, we have this distinction between Dal Rieda and Pictland in Scotland for a long time during the early Middle Ages. Um, but by about 900, we get a new political entity that has come in. Yep, so we get this new political entity, uh, the Kingdom of Alpa. Um, and this political entity 
sort of appears out of nowhere. We have no sources that are writing contemporaneously. So we're not sure exactly what happens, but it's very important because obviously that means the kingdom of the Picts disappears and so does the Pictish language. And if you look at it from a certain angle, it looks like this happens overnight and you think, how can the Picts just disappear? Poof, with a poof of smoke, they're gone. But probably it's, it's a more complex process. Now, Irish was already spreading into Pictland even before this political conquest. This is with the conversion of the Picts. This was Columba. Columba was an Irishman. He came over, founds Iona, um, which was in the Dalriadan sphere of influence. But you also get churches spreading throughout Pictland. And, and looking into this, I'm thinking that if there are monks coming from Ireland, they're going to be coming. They're going to be establishing churches, monastic foundations. They're going to be speaking to people, to the Picts. So they would be already learning Irish um, to communicate with the church. The, in a, in in a way, um, it's comparable to the Swahili coast, for example, where you get trade with uh, Muslim traders uh, and then you get the spread of Islam and that's when you get Arabic coming into that area. You see it there, um, very important. As well, we also see um, Columba actually has to ask special permission from the Pictish king to come to Orkney to get protections. And we also see the spread on, this is on Orkney, and you can see there on, on this, uh, I believe it's a type of millstone, um, that you can see the, the script there, that's the, the Ogham script, or I think Oam is how it's pronounced in, in modern Irish. Um, but that's, that's an Irish script that's being used on Orkney, which was traditionally a Pictish-speaking area. And this is from before the political conquest, so we can see already language has moved. Um, something that I found very interesting, actually, was to look at what um, Alex Wolfe has been saying about the, the transition from Pictish to, uh, to Gaelic um, in Scotland. And this is actually that the language is aren't that far removed. And this is something that I think, as someone who doesn't speak any Celtic languages, I thought P-Celtic, Q-Celtic, you know, chalk and cheese, completely different. But then I thought, actually, with my Frisian background, we, we, we are having a lot of issues in the Frisian community at the moment that lots of Frisian speakers are having their language, let's say, diluted by Dutch words. It's something with Scots and English as well that can be an issue. But of course, Frisian and Dutch are actually in different branches of the West Germanic languages. And so something similar can be happening here. These languages aren't that different. As, again, Simon yesterday demonstrated, there are, there's a lot of overlap between these languages. So it's not too hard to imagine that there's a switch. Now, what you will see, which is very interesting, when, when a large group of people switches from one language to another, is that a lot of the time, grammatical features from the language that they were speaking will come into the language that they do. And lo and behold, some of the differences between Scots Gaelic and Irish, uh, we actually see grammatically similarities between Cornish, uh, Welsh, so P Celtic, potentially related to the Pictish language they were speaking, are similar to Scots Gaelic, which makes it different from Irish. So this might be um, an impact that it had. Again, um, it's on the, the handout in the pink folder. Um, Alex Wolfe is the guy to read on that. Also, as I got into already, code switching might be happening between these languages, that there was a, a significant degree of bilingualism already, that they'd know both languages and that you'd get words coming in from both. Um, and it's less of a shift from, let's say, Pictish to Gallic, and more of that you had uh, Pictish-influenced Gallic dialects and Gallic-influenced Pictish dialects. And when you see it that way, actually, the, the sort of coming together isn't, isn't that difficult. Um, and within a few generations already, we, we can see modern examples, again, uh, Frisian or Scots just being two of them, we can see that this is, this is something that can happen quite quickly, um, rather than that a whole group of people sort of disappears, as has been said. But anyway, um, I will move forth and start talking about the Britons. Now, the Britons um, is being used here as a, a linguistic term for P-Celtic inhabitants, rather than for early supporters of the Better Together campaign. Um, <laughs> I should stress. <laughs> um, so the Britons are very interesting. Now, of course, as I said already, um, the P-Celtic languages were all throughout Britain, but the Romans divide this up. So we, we locate the, the Britons in Scotland at this time. We, we separate them from the Picts. Um, so it's below the Firth of Forth. Um, and we also have this dividing line in Galloway. There's um, Gallic influence in Galloway, later Norse influence as well. Um, so we sort of find them in, in the south of Scotland for a long time. Now, this is Dumbarton. Now, on I believe it's on the right rock there. That was where the fortress of um, Dumbarton, uh, very important fortress for the Britons of Strathclyde. Um, and this is the important British kingdom that lasts the longest. 
Now, um, yesterday, I'm not sure if the last is still there who asked the question about Cumbric, um, but yesterday was the last who asked the question about Cumbric. Um, and so Cumbric is located within, again, the insular and the Brythonic, so the P-Celtic, and it's often split off, again, seen as a daughter language of Brythonic um, that's related to Pictish, Welsh, Cornish, for example. And the place names that we find often uh, have car in them, so in Carlisle, which is now in England, because Strathclyde stretched into England as well, um, Caleverock, uh, and Glasgow as well. Um, these are names that are uh, Brythonic, probably from the kingdom of Strathclyde. The care is interesting. The care is um, a word for fort. Um, and one of the older names for Edinburgh that's sometimes given is Care Aden, um, as well as Din Aden. Um, what's interesting about Cumbric is that the northern part of Cumbric will have been separated from the southern Brythonic dialects because of the Romans. You obviously have Hadrian's Wall. Um, and th there is communication over the wall as well, but this would have been a fairly significant barrier for the dialect continuum. So it would be interesting to see if we had any Cumbric, and spoilers, we don't, um, then it would be interesting to see what the effect would have been um, on Cumbric compared to, say, Welsh or Cornish. Um, what we get as well is the expansion of the Anglo-Saxon kingdom of Northumbria, and this actually cuts off the um, Cumbric-speaking areas from uh, the speakers uh, of Brythonic languages in Wales, uh, or West Wales as it was once called, which is Cornwall. So again, we, we can see that this language probably would have split off and developed quite differently from Welsh and Cornish due to no longer being part of the continuum. However, there is a lot of cultural uh, connection between them. Um, and this is something we'll see with one of the poems in the Urgodothin, um, which is an absolutely beautiful poem. I recommend that you all read it. Um, and actually, if we look at this poem, it's in Welsh, it's in Middle Welsh, uh, it's recorded in the Book of Anaeron in the 13th century. It's thought by looking paleographically at this and looking at the language that it was the originals from the 9th century, but it describes events uh, that probably took place in the very early 7th century. Um, and this is looking, uh, it's, it's a really great poem. It's basically uh, a war band gets together from around the area of Edinburgh. Uh, they all get very drunk and then they go, right, we're going to go and, and fight some Saxons. Um, oh, so I shouldn't have said that because that, that's going to come up later. Um, <laughs> but basically they go and fight the Saxons. It doesn't go very well. Sorry, the home team loses that one, uh, which never happens because Newcastle always seems to get smashed in football and whatever, but apparently in fighting they were a bit better. Um, but they, they go down there, they, they get beaten, but it's a, it's a beautiful poem. Um, and it's possible that this is a Cumbric original if, if it's coming from the north, if it's a traditional story being told in the north that's then transported by court bards coming into Wales and that it's then recorded in the 13th century, um, potentially from an earlier original there. Um, now, the Vikings, they also play an important part in this, and actually in 870, there's a very devastating raid on uh, Dumbarton. They capture the British king, and they take him to Ireland, sell him into slavery in Dublin, um, and, and he dies. And this actually causes a, a great political upheaval. One of the things that we see uh, as a result of this is that um, Gaelic place names start to move southwards around the area of Lomond that had been a Brythonic speaking area, we find place names. And often, if you find place names changing, it indicates speakers are changing language as well. Well, um, the reason being the, the, the uh, chaos caused by, by the Vikings, especially their attack on Dumbarton. But what we also find is that a century later in the uh, 10th century, we actually get Brythonic place names moving south. So this seems to be a whole area of speakers on, on the move in a way, which is very interesting because they then move into parts of England today. Um, Cumbria, actually, is from the same root as Cymraeg, as, as Wales. The Cymri uh, are the kin. So the Cumbrians and the Welsh are really, they go way back um, in a way, which is a very interesting distinction. But in the 11th century, we get the Kingdom of Alpa. It annexes Strathclyde. Um, and this signals the, the beginning of the end for the Brythonic speakers of Scotland, um, which we see. It's, it's annexed at some point in the 11th century. Again, it's a little bit unclear exactly how this happens. Um, but what we see is that they dispossess the landholders, and the landholders had been Brythonic speakers. They dispossess them um, with uh, in people that, they, that they've imported from, uh, from England, so people who were speaking Old Norse, uh, Scandinavians, uh, Norman French, people who were speaking Old English, uh, Middle English at this point. Um, and that's why the, the elite loses the Brythonic language, and at that point it's, it's a slow decline for the rest speaking the languages. But... Just like with Pictish, it's very much possible that actually they, in pockets they were continuing to speak these languages, but these, these people would be invisible because if they're not writing it down, 
we don't know about it, which is unfortunate, but it's it's fun to speculate. And this might be, again, um, as Simon said yesterday in the north of England, that the way of counting sheep in the old Cumbric language, um, which is which is hilarious, you should definitely look it up if you missed that, um, that that continued in certain rural communities as well with um, the Brythonic speakers there. But to return to the Godothin, um, this is actually leading into my next point, which is that um, if they're f who are they fighting in the Godolvin? It's the men of Brenaich. And I already spoiled this before, and I, I shouldn't have. Um, but if you see Brenaich, you'd think, oh, they're fighting more Britons. This is a Celtic name. But actually, Brenaich is the, in the Old English is Bernicia, and this was a kingdom of Northumbria. But what's interesting is that Brenaich is actually uh, an Old Brythonic name, and the Old English speakers, the Anglo-Saxons, have taken this name and thought, Brenaich sounds a bit too Welsh, we'll make it Bernicia, which sounds more, uh, more English for them. So the next group of people I'd like to talk about are the Anglo-Saxons um, who come in. Yeah, I, I apologize for all these little speech marks. It's, I always put them in my videos. I think it'll be fun. Um, but uh, <laughs> if they are, that remains to be seen. But um, the Anglo-Saxons uh, spoke a language called Old English. It's the ancestor of the language that I'm speaking now. Um, and these are some other languages uh, in, in that branch of the West Germanic family at the time. We've got Old Frisian, uh, the ancestor of modern Frisian, uh, and Old Saxon as well um, that's there. So. In England, we see that they, they move northwards from uh, Northumbria. There's a, a very uh, warlike king called Ethelfrith. Um, he's probably responsible for doing in quite a few of the old kingdoms of the Henogleth, so the, the old speakers of Brythonic. Um, and it's his son, Oswald, who some of you might know. He's called St. Oswald. The current Northumbrian flag is a version of, of his old flag. Um, and he expands northward in AD uh, 638. He captures Edinburgh um, and expands into Lothian. And this is when we get the expansion of a Germanic language into Scotland for the first time. So often it's been said as a sort of popular etymology that Edinburgh is from Edwin Buch, um, which is Edwin was another Anglo-Saxon king, but there's several reasons this doesn't work, one of which is that in, during his reign, uh, the Northumbrians hadn't actually conquered this region yet. It's quite a big one. Um, and the other one is that the actual etymology, again, it comes from Din Aden, uh, which, which is a Celtic word. However, the Burg part of the, uh, the name Edinburgh does come from the Anglo-Saxons. Um, you might know Alfred the Great is very famous for building the Burrs. A lot of English place names also have Burrs in them, like Middlesbrough, um, Borough Bridge, these kinds of places. And it basically means a, an enclosed area, fortified town um, in Old English. Um, now, what's interesting is that they capture the region of Lothian, but the sphere of influence is quite large south of the Firth of Forth. Um, and some of the really very beautiful things that we find um, is this, which is the Rothel Cross, which is in Dumfrieshire. And what makes this cross really interesting is actually the depictions on it. It's absolutely stunning. There's a, there's a copy of it in the British Library as well in London. Um, or actually, it's much quicker to go and see it in, in Dumfries if we're here. Um, but what's great about this is that it has a runic inscription on it in Old English. Um, and this is part of it there. And this is the Northumbrian dialect of Old English. So if you've studied some Old English before, more than likely you've studied the West Saxon dialect of Old English, which is from a little bit later. But this is the transcription of the, the runic inscription. And actually it contains part of a poem called The Dream of the Rood. Um, which isn't actually a euphemism, I'm glad to tell you. It's actually rude is the Old English word for cross. And it's also found in Holyrood, for example. Um, so it's the, the Holy Cross. Uh, and the dream of the rude is the dream of the cross. That's why it's, it's on a cross. It all starts to come together. Um, and what's interesting about this is actually that we have this, this section of the dream of the rude, of this poem, that's in runes on the cross from the 8th century in the Northumbrian dialect. But we also find the whole poem of the Dream of the Rood um, in the Vecelli book, which was written in the 10th century in the West Saxon dialect of Old English. So as nerdy linguists, we can now start to look what are the differences? How has the language developed? Um, and how are, the, how are the dialects different? And actually, you can see quite a lot of differences that are there before which might be interesting for speakers of Scots, because, of course, Scots, a lot of that comes from the Northumbrian dialect of Old English rather than the West Saxon dialect of Old English, which was very important for the shaping of modern standard English, as well as Anglian dialects um, involved there. So that's, that's a really interesting thing to do. One of, one of the main things that I straight away noticed is there are a lot more diphthongs 
in the West Saxon Old English, so it kind of goes up and down a bit more. Whereas in Scots, it doesn't tend to go up and down with the vowels as much, which is something that you see um, in the Northumbrian dialect of Old English as well. Um, now, another thing that's interesting for Scots and the Old English language is obviously that we get the expansion of the Northumbrians into Lothian, um, and this is when we get uh, the dialect of Old English coming up. But actually, we also get the Danish invasions of the Great Heathen Army starting in 865, and so we get lots of Scandinavians. Um, well, it's debated whether there's lots of Scandinavians, but their influence is very large. And so we get a lot of Scandinavian words um, and grammatical forms that come into the language there. Um, and they are very important for the modern English language as well. But what that basically means is that the densest area was more to the south of Northumbria, um, as well as the, the kingdoms of East Anglia and parts of Mercia as well. Um, and what this means is basically that there's a disruption of the dialect continuum. And what happens is that the uh, kings of the Canmore dynasty, so who ruled Scotland um, in, in the 12th century, for example, is a lot of the time they imported speakers of the English from these eastern areas into the lowlands of Scotland, into the Burr towns, again, that word Burr, of lowland Scotland. And so they're importing a lot of the speakers who have these Old Norse influences, which have also made it into Scots. So I believe in Scots, if you ask someone a question, you spear someone a question. And this comes directly from Old Norse. But there was never any Old Norse settlement in Lothian in the borders. And so this influence actually comes indirectly from the Middle English of the eastern parts of England. And so for people who um, attest that Scots is just a dialect. Actually, if you look at the, in terms of the dialect continuum with the north of England, there is a significant break there. And that's why I think this period is really important for understanding things. Now, of course, Scots develops differently in the later Middle Ages, and that's the, the key period for Scots. But this is nonetheless an important distinction um, to be made. Now, this is possibly the most Frisian picture of myself that I could find that didn't involve clogs and a few cows. And there is a reason for that. Um, now, this is because I would like to talk a little bit about the, the relationship between Frisian uh, and Scots and Dutch and English as well, because this is one of the things I noticed as a child. Um, now, these are actually different branches of the West Germanic languages. Now, English, Scots, and Frisian are all made up in the Anglo-Frisian. Um, potentially, we need to change the name if we do put Scots in there as well, because we sort of we, we, we have both English and Frisian, but we don't have Scots that's, that's included in the title. Um, now, we have another branch, the Franconian branch, where we get Dutch, Afrikaans, and Flemish in there as well. Now, one of the things that I noticed, actually, um, already as a child uh, when coming to Scotland is about the palatalized velar consonants, which is a, a big term, but it's, it's about using the tongue to pronounce certain consonants. Um, and so we have like the ch, the j, the sh. It's, it's utilizing the tongue when at the top of the palate, the top of the mouth, uh, when you're making them. So for example, in English, you have church and cheese. You're utilizing these sounds. Now, if you never looked at Frisian, don't be alarmed. These the, this is just the way that we make the ch sound in, in writing. So this is cherica and cheese. Very easy if you're an English speaker. Actually, we have the, um, the very famous, well, we say it's famous. In Friesland, it's famous. Uh, the saying which is bre and green cheese, wat net sizekien is geen op rechte fries. And maybe you understood a little bit of that, but it's butter, bread, and green cheese. Whoever can't say it is not a real Frisian. Um, so there's, there's a lot of overlap between English and Frisian in this way. But if we look at Scots and Dutch, you've got words like kirk um, and also kebok, which I realize is a, a loan from Gaelic. But it's interesting that they have loaned a word that again has the different sound, the k. Just like in Dutch, if we have church and cheese, we have kerk and gas which is very different to the English and the Frisian. And this is probably due to later medieval contact with the Low Countries, with Flanders, for example. There's a lot of uh, wool trade that goes up and down the North Sea. There's a lot of immigrants that come from Flanders that settle here, and they probably reinforce these differences between Scots, between Frisian, between Dutch. And that's there. So a lot of these words that I was picking up when I was listening to these old Jacobite songs, they could come in uh, from the Old English, from feacht, which uh, is, is fight, um, or from fecht, which is the, the Dutch. And it could also be the case that it's both, because if you've got people coming over who go and they pronounce the word fecht, you're more likely to continue pronouncing the word fecht as well, because it makes it easier for them to understand. And money makes the world go round, as well as wool, because you know we're in Edinburgh. We all understand that wool is very popular. And it was back then, too. 
Um, so, with that, I want to get on to the Norse. Um, I think that one went by a little bit quickly. Now, the Norse are, of course, famous for being very bloodthirsty Vikings, for coming in, for trashing the place, um, and then leaving the place in an absolute mess. But they are also very important for the history of languages. They bring an awful lot more than just sort of uh, pillaging and murdering. Now, they do definitely do pillaging and murdering as well. I do want to stress that. I'm not trying to take that away from their image. Um, <laughs> which I think would be quite difficult, to be honest. Um, now, let me see. Yes, because in uh, 806, they, they sack Iona, they kill 68 members of the clergy there. Um, so they're, they're clearly violent, but we also see that they bring other things. Uh, for the politics of Scotland, I already mentioned how their coming really disrupts the southern uh, Brythonic kingdoms. You get movement of Gaelic speakers moving south. You get, again, the movement of Brythonic speakers. They sack Dumbarton. Um, so politically, they're very important. Economically, they're also very important. They do change the way that people used money. They, they pump silver into local economies. Uh, just like in Ireland, there were no towns before the Vikings arrived, and then you get the rise of places like Dublin, Wexford, Waterford. And that's, of course, just across the water from Scotland, so also important there. Um, but culturally and linguistically, too. So areas where Old Norse was spoken in Scotland um, would be on the Northern Isles, Orkney and Shetland, the Western Isles, and Caithness. These are the areas where it's spoken most, uh, probably also um, in some form in Galloway, but it's a bit of a different situation there because you've got a, ver a very strong mixed group um, of Gaels and, 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 um, and Norsemen there. Um, now, what's interesting, actually, is that we can trace how they interact with different groups in Scotland in different ways. Now, of course, as I mentioned, Iona, they, they, they plunder it, they kill everyone, and Iona sort of falls from its high stature that it had been before. But in areas of uh, the Hebrides, for example, we see a lot of Old Norse place names that come up. Um, and there's even more that they do there. So. At the island, um, at the site of Whithorn as well, which was an, an Anglo-Saxon monastic site, we see that there's evidence of flooding. But what happens after the flooding is we see that the same type of houses that were being built in Dublin are then built at Whithorn. So it's the image of the Norse recreating this monastic site. And Whithorn continues to produce uh, stone crosses, cross slabs, uh, and, and continues in its function that it had done before as well. So it's not just destruction and death. Uh, that we see there. Of course, the place names in the Western Isles probably denotes that the people there switch to speaking Old Norse um, and the material culture that, that changes incredibly rapidly there. Um, what we see as well, actually, very interesting, this is actually a cross slab from um, the island of Barra. And what we see is that, of course, it's still a very Christian motif. It's still the same kind of cross that they were doing before. But if we look at how the inside is decorated, that's actually a Scandinavian style. It's a Mammon style uh, that's being used. So they're, they're integrating different cultural aspects in their cross. And, of course, on the reverse, we have the, the runic alphabet. This is in the younger Fudark. Um, which is they're using to write Old Norse there, so we can clearly see the language. Now, what's interesting here is that this does suggest that there is a mixing between the groups, because why else would you have the same cross that's being depicted as all the other crosses? That's probably someone who's been doing this for a while. It's probably someone from the island. But would someone from the island know how to write in runes? If they're bilingual, they probably would. Um, or it suggests that they're working together. So it's very interesting to, to use these uh, sources as as clues for what they were doing um, on on the island of Barra, for example. We also get a lot of these smaller islands have uh, these Old Norse names, so names that end in, in A or U. Um, it's island in Old Norse um, that we see there. Now, the Norse, the Old Norse actually comes from the North Germanic uh, branch of languages. This is the, the modern branch, the, the, the biggest languages that are spoken there, with West having Norwegian, Icelandic, and Faroese. Uh, and East Danish and Swedish, but in the in the Viking Age, this would have been the Old West Norse dialect and the Old East Norse dialect. And what's interesting is that these areas are, are where Old West Norse is being spoken, so from uh, Vikings, from Norsemen coming from Norway, whereas these areas here, this was conquered by the Danes, it's the Dane law uh, in England, 
this was where speakers of Old East Norse were. So we can actually see some of the differences in how um, Old East Norse influenced modern English and Middle English, um, and then how Old West Norse influenced these other parts, which is an interesting distinction, again, when we look at the influences that later come in into Gaelic, for example, into Irish, um, as well as into Scots. Um, and these are some runes actually from Mace Howe, so on Orkney, where they, where they sort of carve into these prehistoric monuments. They're very famous for sort of spreading graffiti everywhere. There's also some in the Hagia Sophia, in uh, it's uh, Constantinople, uh, not Constant Constantinople, it's Istanbul now. You, you can tell you're a student of history when you sort of mix the names of Constantinople and Istanbul. Um, but you can see on top of one of the pillars, sort of half Dan was here, which is which is quite funny. Uh, one of the one of the Norsemen there, deciding that he'd leave his name there forever. Um, what's interesting, though, is that not, it's not just in the Viking Age that we find North Germanic uh, languages in Scotland. Actually, after the Viking Age, even in the 14th century on mainland Scotland in Caith Ness, people were still speaking a language that derived from Old Norse, and it, it lasted even longer on, on the islands of Orkney and Shetland. Um, now, <laughs> one of the terms for this language was rude Danish, and um, while that sounds like a bit of an indecent pastry, it is actually, uh, <laughs> it's more commonly referred to as, as Norn, um, which, which is this language, this, this North Germanic language that continues to be spoken. And it continues to be spoken um, in Orkney uh, and Shetland uh, right into the 18th century, the 19th century. And it's very interesting to look into. We do have some sources that record it. And a lot of these words that come from the, the Norn language do actually enter the, the Scots dialects that came into Orkney and Shetland as well um, later on. Now, they are actually trying to revive um, the, the Norn language in Orkney, and they've called it Ninorn, um, which I think sounds a bit like the noise that Noddy's car makes, if I remember from my childhood, but I think that's a very interesting, interesting project, and it would be fun uh, to see where that goes. Um, but where does this actually leave us in terms of the languages of, of Scotland, uh, if we look at it? Well, to quickly summarize, we've got Old Norse that's being spoken in, in the very north, uh, in the islands, the Hebrides, uh, the north of Caithness, and Orkney and Shetland. Uh, we have the area of Old English, so these are our Germanic languages in Scotland, being spoken around the area of Lothian from the 7th century, but probably also spreading westwards, because of course the Rubble Cross, it has runes on it in Old English. Why would you bother putting runes onto a cross if no one in the area can read the runes and understand the language? Probably indicates there are people there who can read runes, who can understand Old English in that region as well. Uh, we have the area of Dal Riada, so for a long time uh, we have the speakers in on the west of Scotland. Apologies, I I'm not sure why I put the little captions there, but I thought it was it was kind of fitting. Um, we have the speakers of uh, of the Godelic, of the Q Celtic, uh, Old Irish there uh, on the west coast. We have also the speakers of the Cumbric language that sort of stretches in this long, thin strip down from uh, the area of, of roughly Glasgow along the Clyde, and then further south um, at its height going right down into England, almost to Lancashire through Cumbria as well. Um, and finally, we also have Pictish that was spoken for a very long time in the northeast of Scotland. And as you can see, there's a lot of overlap between these rings. Um, of course, this is a really nice way. I, I sort of thought I'd do it with rings rather than with shading in uh, bits on the map because, of course, on the ground, it's much more complex than saying this area they spoke Pictish, this area they spoke Gaelic. There's probably a lot of bilingualism that's occurring at this period. And it's sometimes quite hard to say would this language have been Pictish? Would this language have been Irish? Um, and and how, how we would define that there. So some concluding remarks then. Um, I think that the region of, you know, the country of Scotland in this period is incredibly linguistic diverse in this area. And I think things change a lot. Things are constantly shifting. Um, and I think that's one of the fascinating things about language in the early Middle Ages is that we don't really know that well. For later periods, we do know because you know people are writing things down, which is great. But unfortunately, we don't really know um, what exactly people were doing. Scotland, it was both involved looking inwards. So you had the, you know, the Picts, you had the Britons, but they also all looked outwards. The Britons, uh, they're writing down what happened to them, even though it was their defeat um, at the Battle of Catrath with the Godothin. Um, we also have, of course, the, the Norse languages coming in. They're looking to Scandinavia for influences, for cultural influence. We have the Anglo-Saxons coming in. That connects them to the whole 
Anglo-Saxon world as well, um, as well as, of course, the Dal Riadans who look to Ireland for their cultural inspiration. So there's a lot of, um, it, it's definitely a, a Scottish picture, but it's also a picture that looks very much outwards to different places for influences, which we can now all see in the languages that are still spoken in Scotland. Um, I think that an important distinction to make as well is that politics and languages are, as ever, very intertwined, and they certainly were back then. You see, with the rise and fall of certain kingdoms, you know, we, we find that Pictland disappears, and lo and behold, Pictish is gone too. We find the rise and fall of uh, the Prothonic Kingdom of Strathclyde also coincides with when we hear that they're speaking a British language in these areas. So that's very important. I think that's there's something to be told about that today as well, that politics and language are certainly very much connected whether we want them to be or not. Um, but of course religion and trade very important as well as we saw with the spread of Irish into Scotland, uh, as we saw with uh, Flemish merchants coming and trading in wool. These are all important things, um, who people are interacting with, which languages they speak and how this shapes the way they speak and which language they decide to speak. And finally as well I think, um, especially from, from reading through Alex Wolfe's uh, work, on uh, the languages of Pictish uh, and Gaelic and how they interacted. I think a lot of the time we get very hung up on language, dialect, and the distinction between them. But actually, I think I would propose that it's probably easier to think more in terms of a sliding scale when we're talking about these, because everyone speaks a language in their own ways. Groups of people speak them very differently. And I think historically, this makes the picture a lot clearer if we think of people who are speaking languages, yes, that are different from other people, but who are also borrowing influences, who are also constantly evolving and adapting what that language actually is and how it changes. And I think that does explain quite a few of the changes that we see in the early Middle Ages there. All right. so. Thank you very much for listening.